our first panel today is what does the most recent research indicate regarding LASIK's administration for thoroughbred racehorses? And is LASIK appropriately used now? This panel is going to be moderated by Scott Palmer. Dr. Palmer serves jointly as New York's first ever equine medical director and as an adjunct professor at Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania's School of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Palmer chaired the New York Task Force on Racehorse Health and Safety. The two panelists today are Corinne Sweeney. Corinne Sweeney serves as Associate Dean for the, at the New Bolton Center at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine and as a Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to her appointment as Associate Dean, Sweeney served for 28 years as an equine internal medicine specialist. Dean Sweeney, who has published numerous papers on furosemide and racehorses, also served as chair of the Pennsylvania Horse Racing Commission. Dr. Paul Morley is a professor of epidemiology and infection control at Colorado State University. Professor Morley is part of a long-standing collaborative group that has published several papers in the Equine Veterinary Journal that addresses the effects of exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhaging on performance as well as the efficacy of Lasix in controlling the condition. Dr. Palmer? Thank you, Rob. And I'd appreciate it if you'd bring my glass of water back if you have a chance. Oh, <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to need it sooner or later. Well, again, my personal welcome to all of you this morning. Great to have you here. And commissioners, I hope that you find this experience to be informative and enjoyable. Um, we are very fortunate to have this opportunity to talk to some eminent researchers this morning because, as Rob said, there really is no more controversial, more passionate, more divisive issue than the use of race day LASIKs in America. Why is that? Why is it so controversial? Why are people so passionate about it? Why haven't we been able to sort this out in, in the last 40 years? Well, frankly, I think it, Nick Nicholson, who is the retired president of Keeneland Racetrack, framed it best in an equine law seminar in Kentucky in 2012 when he said, in my thinking, Lasix is a classic example of competing truths. And we as an industry have difficulty with competing truths. And I think that nobody could say that better. This is, really hits the nail right on the head. The currency of the academic community is truth. Researchers dedicate their lives to the, to the discovery of truth and we rely on them to separate fact from fiction. In the LASIK controversy, there is one fundamental truth. We are all entitled to our own opinions about LASIKs and horse racing, but we are not entitled to our own set of facts. That's really important to remember that. Volumes have been written on this issue. If you did an online search on the topic of furosemid in the horse, you would find 905,000 results. So this morning in this panel, we will review one by one 905,000 documents. Only kidding. We are privileged to have these two eminent researchers here this morning, Corinne and Paul. And uh, I won't repeat their introduction. It was very well done by Rob. But both of these speakers have helped author the recent consensus statement on exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage published by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine. Each of our speakers will begin with a short statement, and then we will address uh, Ben Liebman's list of questions that are pertinent to the subject. Our commissioners, of course, are urged to, to join in the conversation. So, Corinne, ladies first, let's start with you. Thank you, um, and I'm going to ask, for starters, whether you can all see me or at least hear me. We can. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for the kind invitation participate in today's program. Um, as it's been said, the topic is sort of near and dear to me both as an uh, equine veterinary internist and as a fellow horse racing commissioner. And I want to applaud the... Uh, I just hung up. I was listening and I was sitting. Excuse me. I want to applaud you for having this educational program today because as commissioners, we're tasked with many things of uh, promoting, preserving, uh, protecting... Uh, making sure that we have the highest integrity and quality of racing in each of our states. And as uh, mentioned earlier, I think we try to make our uh, decisions based on what's best uh, in the best interest of horses and horse racing. I want to start with just a few comments about uh, the, the problem of EIPH or uh, bleeding. 
And there have been many scientists um, that have contributed to the understanding uh, of why horses bleed or why horses have BIPH. And one of the uh, one of those at the forefront is Dr. Ed Robinson. I'd like to. This isn't probably a direct quote, but a coined a phrase a number of years ago that EIPH is an inevitable consequence of the high cardiac output of the elite athlete. So if we realize it's any horse or pony, whether they're playing polo or cross country phase of a three day event, pony club event, standard breads, quarter horses, standard breads, any horse that races fast enough to have one of these high pressure events will bleed. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the horse's heart or the horse's lung that makes it initially bleed. And if the horse didn't race fast enough or didn't run fast enough, doesn't have a high pressure event, the horse won't bleed. A problem develops so when we have repeated bleeding, that these broken capillaries and the presence, presence of blood then results in this remodeling, uh, among other things, in the lung. And so we now have sort of a physiologic event it develops a pathologic problem, and it's likely that the amount of this remodeling is dependent on how often, how many times the bleeding episode has occurred. So I'll conclude right now and say that EIPH is not a disease, but it's actually the consequence of health and exercise in a horse or an animal that has a high cardiac output resulting in these high pressure events. And some have called EIPH a production disease, meaning it's a uh, disease or condition induced by our management practices. Um, Dr. Morley is now going to introduce the uh, idea of what we did in our ACVIM consensus statement. Paul? All right. Can you hear me? I'm having trouble with the uh, audio over the computer. I can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. We're having a hard time hearing Paul. Um, I'm... I'm not able to get the video. You can't get my video either. Paul, well, we're, we're we're really having a hard time with the audio, and no, and I don't have any video of you. I'm logged on here. Um, I have a headset on at the moment. I'm on the telephone line, actually. Okay. Well, if you could just speak up a little bit, Paul, that would be helpful. Uh, I'll do my best here. Um, so I'll, I'll continue here. There seem to be some technical difficulties, but I'll continue. The audio uh, is better. That's good. Thanks very much for the invitation to participate here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Um, I've, I've spent a, a fair bit of my career as a veterinarian working on the, the health of horses, and one of the issues that, that we've spent a fair bit of time paying attention to is uh, the condition of exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage. The uh, consensus statement that uh, Dr. Sweeney mentioned was uh, commissioned by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine uh, in recognition of the importance of this issue for the health of horses as well as the controversy that, uh, that, that surrounds it uh, regarding racehorses. The panel was made up of professionals who have uh, experience working with this condition and with the issue of LASIKs. They included the chairman, which was Dr. Ken Hinchcliffe, uh, Laurent Coutil, uh, Peter Knight, myself, Ed Robinson, Corinne Sweeney, and Emanuela Van Erk. And we started this effort trying to perform a systematic review that would be uh, least uh, tainted by opinion and, and would be guided by the published facts around the data. Um, despite the commonness of this condition, uh, the, the published research around this area is, uh, is sometimes uh, spotty and sometimes uh, some of the work is older. So it was, it was important to us that we base our, our research on best possible evidence. Uh, the panel decided upon uh, which questions were of most pertinence to the issue, and then they categorized those as critically important, important, or moderately important, and we, we concentrated on those questions that we deemed to be critically important and important to the issue. We then gathered the published research that was available around these questions, uh, and then uh, broke into smaller groups to um, 
gather a, an initial uh, impression about what we should say, uh, and we then got together as a group to finalize those recommendations. The evidence is graded uh, as being strong, or moderate, or weak in terms of what the conclusions are, uh, and we followed a, a systematic review process, which is called GRADE, G-R-A-D-E, which is a published method for performing systematic reviews. And with that, I'll turn it back to Corinne. Okay, thank you. So there were four major areas that we looked at, and uh, the first area the topic was, what is the impact of EIPH on the welfare and the health of the horse? And I'm going to give the, the, the results uh, rather than the every detail. And so I'm just going to mention these as, as findings. And the first finding is that they're very, and you'll hear the expression, you know, low quality, moderate quality, or high quality, as far as the evidence. So, and that's based again on the, the rigor of the studies that we were reporting on. Uh, the first finding is that there's very low quality evidence of any consistent clinical abnormalities in horses with EIPH, with the exception of epistaxis, and that would be bleeding out the nose. And with, with epistaxis, there's moderate quality evidence that there's an association between that, that clinical sign. Then there's moderate quality evidence that horses with EIPH grade one to three are not associated with a shorter racing career, while there's moderate quality evidence that thoroughbred horses with epistaxis or grade four EIPH have shorter careers. There's high quality evidence that some horses with EIPH have extensive and characteristic pulmonary lesions lung lesions. There's moderate quality of evidence that EIPH is progressive and related to the load of racing. And then there are a number, I'm going to read these next five findings that are very low quality evidence. So we found that there wasn't very low quality evidence of an adverse effect of EIPH on arterial blood tension during exercise, oxygen tension, excuse me, during exercise. There's very low quality evidence that EIPH is associated with sudden death in racehorses. And there's no evidence of increased risk of sudden death in horses with EIPH. There's quality evidence that EIPH leads to inflammation in either the pulmonary parenchyma, the lung, or the airway. And there's also very low quality evidence that inflammation causes EIPH. We did not locate any evidence that EIPH is associated with the development of other lung diseases. And there is no published evidence regarding the heritability of EIPH. So those were our findings under the topic is what are the impact of EIPH on the welfare and the health of horses. Paul? Thanks, Corinne. Um, the next area was uh, whether or not EIPH affects the performance of racehorses. Overall, uh, there was considered to be a moderate quality evidence uh, in the published literature that EIPH does, in fact, uh, detrimentally affect performance of racehorses. Uh, the specific outcomes that were, were looked at included uh, the finishing position of racehorses, the finishing time, uh, the distance that a horse finishes behind the winner, race earnings, and whether or not uh, the, the uh, effect on performance was uh, related to the severity of EIPH in a, in a dose manner, so that the worse the EIPH, the worse the performance. And uh, for uh, most of those, there was moderate quality evidence with regard to those findings. Um, the, the next question that we evaluated was whether or not there are effective preventive interventions for EIPH. Uh, the, the first one that was evaluated is, is obvious and, and is uh, the reason uh, for this meeting, which is whether or not furosemide or Lasix or Salix uh, is an effective uh, prophylaxis or preventative for EIPH. 
and the conclusion was that there there is high quality evidence that uh, furosemide, given it at a dose of a half to a milligram per kilogram, uh, which is consistent with the administration rate in, in most of the racing jurisdictions in North America, when given four hours before exercise, does uh, decrease the severity and the occurrence of EIPH. Um, it was also strong evidence that this was probably moderated by the effect on the pressure, the blood pressure in the lungs during exercise. Uh, when we looked at other interventions which have been evaluated or, or proposed, including uh, aminocroproic acid, uh, bronchodilators, corticosteroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs uh, such as uh, phenylbutazone or banamine, uh, pentoxifilin, um, and, and any others, there was a consideration that uh, there's essentially no evidence in the published literature that these medications are effective in preventing EIPH. Uh, the, la the, the next question that we evaluated was whether or not the administration of furosemide to racehorses uh, as it is given uh, in racing jurisdictions, that is four hours before performance, whether or not that affects performance. And the conclusion of this uh, uh, was asked in, or this question was asked with regard to two areas. One was about horses running on a racetrack and, and whether or not we could evaluate that based upon treadmill studies. And relative to performing under racing conditions, the panel decided that there is moderate quality evidence that, in fact, uh, administration of furosemide does have a relationship with performance. A caveat related to that would have to be, though, that we don't know the mechanism of this. And since we do know that furosemide affects the severity of the IPH, part of this uh, could be moderated by uh, the, the prevention of EIPH in, in these horses. Uh, with regard to racing on a treadmill or running on a treadmill in a simulated race fashion, uh, the panel said that the, the accumulated body of evidence over a large number of studies only provided low quality evidence with regard to the efficacy of furosemide. Uh, Corinne, back to you. Okay. Um, I'd like to just make a, a few comments on the current use of furosemide. Um, this was not part of the consensus. This is just uh, uh, we know that for the most part it is nowadays administered by a third party or a regulatory veterinarian. Uh, we know for the most part uh, racing commissions require a set dose range, usually 150 to 500, a set dose time of administration, usually greater than four hours. Most racing commissions have some uh, established security in place. We know that uh, most horses are eligible um, to receive uh, furosemide. And so as of now, we have to one of a level playing field. Uh, I'd just like to end by saying that these regulations, uh, as far as the dose and the time, uh, were created years ago to allow for the use of furosemide while not compromising post-race drug detection programs. The actual dose and the time of administration was not based on the effectiveness against the IPH. The, the demonstration that it was effective uh, against the IPH, you know, followed the establishment of that dose and time of administration. But that was driven by the need to not compromise post-race drug de programs, drug detection programs. Um, that's, those are my comments at this moment. Um, Dr. Morley, anything else? Uh, thanks, uh, Corinne. I'll just add that um, I think there's there's a couple of important things uh, to consider as well, and that would be that uh, despite the the number of studies that are in the published literature regarding uh, EIPH and regarding uh, different interventions evaluation of LASIK, the the panel was left with a, a very strong impression that uh, much of the available literature. Uh, in scientific studies uh, did not provide strong evidence about this condition, and that had to do with the number of very small studies where six or eight horses were enrolled in a study and, the, and it was performed uh, on a treadmill. And it, it's not that those 
studies don't add to our understanding, but when we're asking questions about whether or not uh, there's efficacy for other preventive uh, um, measures, we need more. We need more data. We need more information. Um, Dr. Hinchcliffe and myself and our colleague Alan Guthrie have been struck as we've studied EIPH in racehorses that the the medication has actually been used for 40 or 40 years or so in racehorses before our study, which provided the strongest evidence with regard to efficacy. And if we're going to uh, change uh, rules about uh, how that drug is administered or about the use of other medications, it would be our strong urging that we fund and perform studies that truly show, demonstrate the, the presence or lack of presence of efficacy for those drugs. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just ask you a couple of questions uh, that came from Ben's inspiring introduction this morning, which I really enjoyed. Um, so, for example, let's let's take one here. Now, Corinne, you mentioned that the dosage for furosemide that's administered at the racetrack was determined primarily in an effort to avoid interference with detecting other drugs. Do you know if there's any scientific information using current testing technology that, that Lasix does interfere with the detection of other drugs? Um. It's, I don't think there is. I think we, it's been well established, and we now have had a number of years, that it, at this dose range and this time frame, it does not interfere with the ability to detect drugs post-race. Paul, do you have a comment about that? That, that's very that's very true what Corinne stated and we have consulted with experts in testing and uh, pharmacologists and and uh, they agree that uh, Lasix is not a masking drug under current testing technologies okay thank you um, do you think that uh, the administration of Lasix in modern racehorses affects the time that the horses are, are allowed to race do you think for example that it, it delays the horse's ability to, to come back from a race and race again, do you think it limits the number of starts um, per year for a thoroughbred racehorse? You know, I, you know, Dr. Palmer, I don't think I'm in a position to answer that. And if I did answer it, I would just be giving you an opinion because I don't have any um, any uh, facts that would base uh, you know, behind that opinion. Might be your panel later today that could better answer that. Paul, do you have any comments on that? Sure. Uh, Basis the extrapolation from uh, the effects in humans, where a large number of people who have, uh, in particular, uh, congestive heart failure are treated with very high doses relative to uh, the ones that we're giving to horses pre-race. Um, they can receive this drug for a very long time without, without observed effects that people talk about. Um, now, that's not racehorses, obviously, so, so we have to be careful about extrapolation from that. When we did our um, field trial evaluating the efficacy of, of furosemide for EIPH in South Africa, we did perform a, uh, a survey of the owners and trainers. Uh, remember that horses were given either Lasix or they given saline as a placebo, and the owners and trainers did not know which drug they received. And we asked them whether or not they thought which drug they thought they got or which treatment they got, whether they got furosemide or the placebo, and we asked them why they said that. And it, the, the trainers were, to, for a very slight margin, able to say uh, when horses got furosemide, but many of them missed their guess on this, and when they talked about horses being uh, washed out uh, or uh, excessively tired or having dehydration or electrolyte imbalances, um, they, those opinions did not correlate with whether or not they got furosemide or uh, saline. And so uh, I, based on that, I, I think that there's a lot of other factors that create those kinds of uh, conditions in racehorses beyond the use of furosemide. Thank you, Paul. You mentioned earlier uh, in your evaluation in the consensus statement that uh, Lasix can improve performance. Is that, does that improve performance in horses that bleed? Or horses that don't bleed, do you make a Can you make a distinction about that? Not based on the studies that have been done. Um, the uh, 
Uh, the, the large study that we performed uh, using race records from uh, over 23,000 horses racing over a 14-day period in North America uh, did not have information about EIPH. All we had was information about uh, racing performance and prior performance as well as the furosemide and phenylbutazone administration. Um, we've been asked why we haven't evaluated the question of performance uh, relative to the uh, the um, field trial where we evaluated uh, furosemide, and the answer is that that study was way too small to evaluate uh, that those those outcomes. In order to evaluate differences in racing outcomes, you know, we need horses. Uh, we need uh, the num the number needs to be on the order of thousands of horses, several thousand of horses, to evaluate these kinds of things. We have proposed studies to evaluate that, but they would be very expensive and difficult to perform and have not been funded. What percentage of horses uh, in your um, review of the literature bled so badly, and I guess we're talking about epistaxis here, that either the health or the performance of the horse would be, com would be compromised if we did not treat those horses with Lasix? Well, that's... That's a good and hard question. Uh, Scott, you saved that one for uh, later in there, didn't you? Uh, that was a joke. Um, the, uh, when we have looked at furosemide in populations, or sorry, when we looked at EIPH in populations where they haven't received furosemide, um, which is the best situation to do that in order to evaluate the effects of EIPH, um, we found that half to two thirds of horses would bleed at a grade greater than greater than or equal to one, right? Using the the zero to four grading that's commonly used uh, uh, throughout the industry. Um, most of those horses are grade one. Um, the, uh, the there's very few horses that bleed at a grade three or grade four. Grade four would uh, generally be the horses where they. Um, uh, bleed into the nostrils. So, so out of a thousand horses in a in a South African study, uh, uh, only 19 actually bled at a grade four. Okay, uh, and so so there's very few of those horses that we would see blood at their nostrils. Now, we've been able to find a performance difference in horses that that bleed at a grade two or three, depending on the depending on the study. So grade one, we can't find a performance association, and so you'd have to ask whether or not um, they would need to be treated relative to their performance. Um, when you when you uh, when you ask the question about affecting their health, that's very hard to say because health outcomes really have not been part of the studied literature. Whether that's with regard to um, uh, Bleeding at a at a single incidence or long term, um, the, the we don't know. Although it has been supposed at times that horses that bleed severely on a repeated basis that they have uh, a, an increased risk for other respiratory diseases. Now we we did consider through much discussion and debate that EIPH was in itself a disease, and maybe Corinne would like to talk to that. Well, I think um, we sort of alluded to that in the beginning, uh, and if it's a, if it's a disease, it'd be, it might be what we call production disease, that it's, uh, it's a disease that we've induced by management practices, by racing. And I, I'm going to use the word running because it's not just horse racing, it's polo, eventing, fox hunting, you have horses. So um, it, it's tricky when we use the word disease. Um, there are, say, there are a number of production diseases in our, in our other animals, in our, our, our milking uh, cows, our dairy cows, by making them, uh, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked there. Um, but it, I don't think we feel that the initial onset is due to disease, due to uh, problems in the heart and the lung, but it does, by repeated episodes of the IPH does cause problems in the lung that we do view as pathologic, as not normal, and not probably in the horse's uh, best interest, not in the best horse health. 
And you can, in, in the consensus statement, there were remarks made that uh, treatment of EIPH is really more of a preventive process than a therapeutic process, that a therapeutic process for EIPH would be managing the outcomes of the bleeding in horses later on, much as you just talked about some of the sequelae that might develop. But in terms of prevention, um, if, if uh, Lasix is shown to help prevent EIPA, EIPH, um, do you think that it's appropriate that we um, not use this medication in two-year-old racehorses. One of the questions that's very, very pertinent today is that should two-year-old horses be treated with Lasix? Should the graded stakes horses be treated with Lasix? Is there a, from a medical perspective and a research perspective, is there a, um, a reason for that that you could help us understand? Oh, anyway. uh, well, <laughs> well, again, a really good and hard question. Um, it does appear that uh, the more races that a horse runs, the higher the likelihood that we're going to find uh, at least one um, um, more severe bleed, whether that we call that a grade three or a grade four or however we want to, however we want to say it. There's not been research, to my knowledge, which says that uh, two-year-olds can't have can't have uh, severe bleeds, or they can't have bleeds that affect their performance. Um, so that that's hard from a medical position to to say because we don't really we don't know we have no indicators uh, that we can use for an individual horse on an individual day that says if I don't treat this horse, it's going to have a more severe bleed, and therefore I have to give it, I should give it for the health of the horse EIPH. We have to use this drug more in a, in a blanket perspective that on average it reduces uh, the incidence and severity uh, without knowing on which particular racing event or, or athletic event, as Corinne pointed out, uh, that the horse is going to have um, uh, a more severe um, EIPH episode, and and again, that in, we don't know that that you know we can't say in two year olds, even in those you know those horses that they're that they're less likely they won't have that. And I agree. If uh, if a horse did not race till it was, it's probably less age dependent than repeated bouts of racing dependent. So if a horse did start to race till much longer or older, it may it may. You know, start to bleed later in life. It, it's began not age related as much as incidence or, or uh, frequency of racing, frequency of these bleeding events. Well, I would direct this question to you to start with. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you thought that one of the reasons why Lasix might improve the performance of horses was because it could modulate the prevalence of EIPH. Um, there are those that would say that Lasix improves the performance of any horse by reducing the body weight of the horse through its diuretic effect. Could you comment on that for us, please? Sure. Uh, we're all familiar with the concept of, of weight handicapping in, in, in horse racing, and, and the industry is a believer that, that this has an impact on the ability to horse, of a horse to race faster. Um, the the administration of a of a um, the dose of Lasix, which is generally used, uh, 250 to 500 milligrams of of furosemide, will cause a reduction in um, body weight. Um, Dr. Hinchcliffe and his group, when he was at Ohio State, performed some very elegant work uh, using treadmill studies in this instance because it was an appropriate model where they um, uh, gave furosemide and ran the horses and then um, without, any, without allowing them to have water, as many or most people would do on a race day. And then they also uh, gave back the same amount of fluid that was lost through urination uh, through administration of IV fluids and showed that there was a, uh, an energy uh, benefit, a performance benefit that could be demonstrated uh, by, you know, not having that fluid in the body. Uh, it makes sense in terms of just the, the concept of moving a, a mass of a larger or smaller size across 
uh, distance, you know, just uh, just the laws of physics. It takes more energy to move a larger mass at the same at the same speed or rate. Um, so it it does make sense, but we really don't have proof about the performance aspects as to which proportion would be uh, which perforce, pr proportion of racing benefit would be related to this uh, energy conservation, uh, the weight loss or the EIPH uh, reduction. Karen, do you have any other comments? No, no, I agree. Do you think that is there is there any scientific evidence that the use of Lasix is weakening the breed of thoroughbred racehorses? And you're asking for scientific. No, there, I, I think I could go so far as say there is no scientific evidence that it is weakening the breed of the thoroughbred racehorse. Paul, because, because there is no scientific evidence, probably evaluating that. Any thoughts, Paul? Um, no, I, I would agree with Corinne that, that you know, that you do hear those words, of course, though, that, that Lasix is weakening the breed. Um, presumably, although they don't elaborate on that, that's because they say that we select for horses that uh, race faster, they're preferentially bred um, uh, to, um, in, in the, for higher end horses. Um, you, you know, I, I don't. I don't have. I don't have a. I don't have a, a statement as to whether or not that's weakening the breed. There, there are some studies that uh, are. I, I guess I would consider them weak, but interesting evidence suggesting that epistaxis, uh, that there is a potentially uh, heritable component, at least as indicated by pedigree analysis. Um, but it that this has not been really uh, well studied and certainly hasn't been studied for uh, anything other than epistaxis or grade four bleeding. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any evidence that you're aware of that the use of Lasix contributes to fatal musculoskeletal injury in racehorses? Um, I would refer back to our, uh, our review of the literature and that we did not feel it was related to sudden death. And of course, um, that's not the question you just asked. You asked about fatal uh, muscular skeletal injury. I assume you're, you're actually mean racing breakdowns as yes, opposed yeah. to sudden death that turned out to be due to a pelvic fracture or something like that, right? Um, correct, no, correct. I don't think there is any evidence. Again, I'll let, uh, sometimes when there is no evidence, it's because it hasn't been looked at. So I'll let Paul, uh, I don't think there's any evidence in our review that there's a relationship between the two. Paul? I agree. There's no evidence in horses really tying the two. There, there is some interesting um, evidence in the last uh, few years of related to uh, EIPH or sorry, geez, uh, Lasix administration uh, to uh, particularly elderly people with a, in association with osteoporosis. But that's a that's a very different situation, and I'd be very careful before I said that that had a direct evidence that it was tied to uh, catastrophic uh, musculoskeletal injury. It, it is interesting, I think, and, and would be something to evaluate. I'm not sure, uh, Paul, if you had an opportunity to listen to Ben Liebman's introductory remarks. I think Corinne had a chance to hear Ben. But one of the things that Ben mentioned in his words of advice to our commissioners was that they should be considerate of of uh, regulating Lasix in harness racing as well as in thoroughbred racing. Can you give us any information or do you have any advice for us based on the scientific review that you did that would pertain to the use of administration of Lasix uh, in standard bred or quarter horse racing? Sure. Well, the first thing would be to <clears throat> state what probably you, you you, most of you or all of you know, which is that furosemide administration occurs at a much uh, lower rate in standard breads than it does in uh, thoroughbreds. Um, quarter horses, uh, racing quarter horses, it it is a bit lower, but probably is is still higher than standard breads. Um, the the occurrence of EIPH and Corinne would probably have as good or better knowledge than I would have about this, but I would say it's not uh, it's not as well studied. It's not as well understood. 
uh, in, in those. Uh, Dr. Larry Soma, uh, who a colleague of Corinne's at uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, they have done work on standard breads looking at this, though, and um, it does appear to have a similar um, uh, association with differences in performance. Uh, I don't think we have the same level of understanding about prevention of EIPH, although I would presume based upon the two large studies that have that performed um, uh, under field conditions and thoroughbreds that we would find the same thing. I agree with that. Corinne? Uh, yes. No, I, I would agree if the uh, standard bread bleed, uh, have the IPH, uh, maybe not uh, with the same prevalence. Some of that has, again, go back to the pathophysiology of the IPH. They may not necessarily have as high a, uh, a vascular pressure as, as frequent a number of high pressure events, and thus they may not um, you know, bleed as frequently or as severely. And that those are may, may not. That doesn't mean they, they can't and they don't. Um, uh, but the Otherwise, um, I'm not sure, let's see the point of the question about uh, the, the difference. I think in our consensus statement, we reviewed all the literature. It was not just uh, uh, studies in um, thoroughbreds. Corinne is a racing commissioner in Pennsylvania, and I know that you have two different racing commissions in Pennsylvania, one for thoroughbred and one for harness. Do you have the same regulations regarding the administration of Lasix in both breeds in Pennsylvania? Well, I don't want to put my hand on a Bible and swear to it because I haven't to review it, I, I think we do. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure we have the same. I know what we, we have in, in, in horse, and I'm pretty sure it is in harness the same. Uh, and if somebody in the room is, uh, knows differently, just speak up. Um, Scott, you should have asked me to check that one before I showed up today. <laughs> I, th I think you're still the authority on the subject right now. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, well, th that's about it for the questions that I had for this panel. Commissioners, do you have anything that's come to your mind in the course of the conversation? Join in. I do. Uh, Dr. Sweeney, Dr. Marley, to, uh, Pete Machetti from the commission. Um, I hate the whole list. I understand high-quality evidence, I think, and low-quality evidence. Uh, but the moderate quality evidence is something I'm not sure about. And for us, we crave and we are looking for opinions. So when we look to opinions, we want opinions based on a uh, reasonable degree of scientific certainty or veterinary certainty. So I'm not sure where that moderate quality evidence falls. I mean, is that something where it's not enough evidence to make a, an opinion that, or reach an opinion where you're comfortable with saying, look, if this is to a reasonable degree of certainty that we believe uh, whatever factors are occurring or can reach an opinion based on that type of evidence. Because I've heard a lot of moderate quality evidence, and I just don't know how to gauge that. Oh, well, why don't you go first uh, back at it, the epidemiologist? Sure. Sure. Commissioner, that's a really good question, and, and it gets a bit to the technicalities of uh, trying to perform this uh, review in a systematic and repeatable fashion using the, um, the guidelines that uh, other bodies have proposed, this grade, this grade system, they would limit our ability to call something high quality evidence until it has been uh, not only uh, evaluated in studies that have a strong likelihood of detecting differences, detecting effects, um, if they're there, but there's also multiple studies that evaluate these things. And that's, that's, that's really where a lot of the EIPH literature falls down, as we tried to indicate, is that um, the, the big studies that we've done around efficacy and performance, they've only been done one or two times. They've been done well, if I, if I can say that myself, um, having been a participant in a number of these. But they, um, in, in the medical field, right, if you were to uh, go to the doctor and ask about whether or not a treatment works or whether or not a disease affects your health, um, they would have caution in making strong conclusions unless there were multiple studies of high quality that were performed. And so when we draw these conclusions around moderate quality, that's really 
that's probably the biggest limiting factor is just the, the number of well-performed studies to, to evaluate these things. I think that um, the studies have been done that are large, have been done well enough that they provide uh, strong evidence that there is an effect and that would not, that would not be um, uh, differed by uh, similarly performed large studies. But you don't know exactly how, uh, you don't have as precise an estimate around what the difference is. So, for example, if we talk about Lasix, you know, we have a we have an estimate from a study that was performed uh, using uh, a couple hundred horses, uh, was well done, uh, blinded, all those kinds of things. Um, but, you know, if another study was performed, they might find a slightly higher or slightly lower uh, uh, estimate of the efficacy or how much it prevents EIPH. So it would differ a little bit from ours. But I don't think it would change the direction of the association. Thank you. Other questions from the commissioners? I wrote it down so I'd remember them. Um, EIPH is a disease. So, John, is, one of our commissioners. Yeah, it's a it's a disease. It's it's a hereditary disease. It's a condition well, one. Uh, if there uh, if there are things in, in our if that is your question. Is EIPH a disease? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, it, we use those words in the consensus, and I think uh, I don't know if we rewrote the consensus whether we would use the word disease again because disease has. Uh, does have a definition, but I think the the what causes the IPH is is not a disease. The disease does not cause the IPH, but once the IPH occurs and occurs repeatedly, it then causes changes in the lung that one might call a disease. And Paul, I, I hope you'll speak up after I finish stopping if it, uh, you disagree. So the onset isn't uh, because the horse, there's disease in the lung or disease in the horse or disease in the heart. It's because he's this athlete that runs so fast and has such a high cardiac output, it has almost back up into the lung that causes this bleeding. Um, redoing this continuously, as we ask our athletes to do, then causes changes that aren't normal in the lung. And so that's why we get to the word that then EIPH almost causes a disease in the lung, but it didn't start from a disease. I, and I, it sounds tricky, and I don't mean to be confusing. And um, Paul, I don't know if you uh, want to add to that. No, I, I think, Corinne, well, I think, Corinne, that you've uh, stated that uh, accurately. Um, I'll, I'll point out that the panel's conclusion around this, you know, or the, sorry, the things that are in that paper were, were written by a panel, and Ed Robinson, uh, a very distinguished scientist from Michigan State, um, he and his colleagues probably have done as much to advance our understanding of the pathophysiology around uh, EIPH and, and the long-term effects as anyone. And he's a very strong opinion. I, I, Corinne, correct me if you, if you think I'm misstating this, but I, he has a very strong opinion that um, the the changes that occur in the lung as a result of the uh, bleeding from the smallest vessels into the lung tissues, that is a disease process. But as Corinne said, the, the extravasation or the, the extravasation of blood related to performance, it, it goes along, in my opinion, it goes along with that um, unique uh, physiology of racehorses that allows them to do the amazing things that they do. You know, there are other there are other physiological adaptations that allow them to be um, excellent uh, athletes, including, you know, they have a very large spleen, and so they actually hold a a, a very large reserve of blood cells uh, that that auto infuse into the uh, into the bloodstream um, when they're when they're racing, and, and much like blood doping that they've talked about in, bi in bicyclists. So, you know, again, I think that 
the 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 high blood pressures that form in the lungs um, that that's a physiological change. The fact that you get bleeding into the tissues, uh, you're bordering on questions of whether or not that's a, that's a disease process, but certainly what happens in the lungs afterward, that is a disease process. Prior to 1973 and the introduction of Lasix, I mean, I realize studies weren't being done, and I assume that there wasn't a lot of post-mortem investigation done. But what do we have any idea what was happening to horses? My understanding was during from '73 on into the '90s, horses were racing more frequently. So, if I'm to understand some of what I'm hearing, that would mean that there would be theoretically more damage to the, the lungs of those horses, right? Because they would have a more frequent um, loading event or uh, pressure event, as you say. So do we have any idea what was happening to the horses? Were the horses coming out of racing with um, scarred lungs? Uh, you know, do we have any idea? Um, yeah, I guess the answer to, I try to always stay to the question and not try to answer my own question, but I don't think we know that. Um, scientifically, I, I do always say that we had racing before furosemide, and and I think we would have racing. We would we would have racing without furosemide, but then it comes to what we've talked about today: it, it, is it in the horse's best interest to try to decrease the IPH? And I think we do have scientific evidence that the use of furosemide decreases, and maybe in some horses it even eliminates um, the IPH. So. Uh, I guess my concern uh, is I've heard that. that the, you know, um, EIPH can uh, affect performance, and I, I think the concern, we have a concern with, is the health of the horse. So mm -hmm. I was just, you know, were we having situations where people were thinking, that, boy, you know, these are bleeders, the grade three, grade, grade four, these horses uh, keep running and they're being damaged. So that later in life and through retirement, you know, they have dif difficulties with uh, their respiratory system or whatever, whatever the uh, byproduct is of uh, too many bleeds. Well, let me throw in another little bit. Back uh, in, before the use of uh, Lasix or furosemide in the early 70s, and then even through the 70s, it was only in the 80s, there wasn't uh, much use of uh, the endoscopic exam. Okay? So horses were determined to be bleeders usually from just observation of blood at the nostril, and those were most likely the more severe bleeders. So the whole idea that most horses were bleeding, uh, which we now know, um, to different degrees, uh, wasn't even known until the late 70s, early 80s. And so even though furosemide was available for use, um, the number of horses, they were in the single digits, or the low di teens, a number of horses on furosemide um, because we, there was not, you know, the horses weren't examined endoscopically. It wasn't determined they were bleeders, so they weren't using it. Hindsight, they were probably bleeders. They were racing, and, but not receiving furosemide. So a lot was happening then. Furosemide was starting to be introduced. The endoscope, uh, endoscopic examinations became routine, but that was some, and, and Dr. Palmer can comment on this. He was there at the time. Um, that occurred some 10 years after the onset of uh, the use of uh, furosemide. Uh, I'll just add that, um, you know, I think your question about the, the health of the horse is, a, is an excellent one. Um, Doctors Guthrie, Hinchcliffe, and I, you know, actually wrote uh, uh, a letter to the racing industry, to the editor, published in the Journal of the Veterinary Medicine, um, Journal, uh, Journal of the AVMA. And, um, you know, I think that is one of the, one of the big questions that we've, fit, we've not answered, uh, which is what, what is the effect of EIPH on the long-term health of the horse, and I, I don't believe we—I don't believe we understand that 
Um, there's no published literature that really looks at that. It would be very difficult to do, not impossible, but it would take a significant investment to, to study that well. There have been two studies that were published this year that looked at uh, uh, the longevity of racing careers uh, based upon uh, a, the outcome of a single uh, endoscopic examination and, and found, it did not find, I, I don't believe, evidence that's, that makes me believe that we understand that, that there's a detrimental effect. But again, I would say that that's looking at a single performance and, and um, uh, we we don't we don't really know that it would be it is something that we really need to answer, in my opinion, in order to give a a statement about the the medically um, uh, critical aspect of treating horses with EIPH for their long term welfare. Paul, in your recent paper, though, did you not look at? Uh, uh, I think maybe I'm maybe I'm not recalling this properly, but I think you said in the paper that. Grades one through three did not have a significant effect on the longevity of these racehorses. And grade four had a very significant effect. Am I right about that? Uh, yes, Th yes. Um, I believe that's a bit confounded by racing rules, uh, Scott. You know, I mean that. Uh, you know, and uh, and uh, also the the likelihood that a trainer is going to take on horses that have been. Um, uh, or that owners are going to invest in further uh, further racing of a horse that's had to take a three month rest or or so because of uh, because of having blood in the nostrils. So I don't think we have a great answer about that. Okay. Sorry. Um, you talked about the South African uh, test in your presentation. A couple times, just from a trivial point of view, I'm trying to understand. Lasix is important to protect the health of the horse, yet the trainers and I thought I heard the number thousands of entries for the study. Is that correct? Uh, it depends on which study you're talking about in in South Africa. We've the the one that we just published with, with regard to EIPH performance did include a thousand horses. Uh, the one where we were looking at uh, the efficacy of of a Lasix that was a couple hundred horses. The effect of, uh, that was the blind that when you gave the placebo Correct. as well. So so was there any indication in that test why the trainers who have deemed Lasix essential to protect their horse were willing to subject their horse to a placebo in a racing condition for it? I mean, it, it sounds like a test like that or a study like that could be very informative as to the output, but if you were worried about the horse bleeding, would that not be somewhat of a problem if you were the trainer of the horse? Uh, that's a really great question. You have to remember that uh, that Lasix is not allowed as a race day medication in South Africa. There is a limited amount of the drug uh, that that is used in training, and I, that's an anecdotal uh, response about how much is actually used in in training. But um, but it's not allowed as a race day medication. And most of the trainers that were involved in this work actually had no experience uh, racing horses on furosemide. So the conclusions weren't really against a base of horses that generally use Lasix. It's more a, a study of horses who had not generally gotten it on race day. Correct. That is correct, and that is <clears throat> that is something to consider. It's also something to consider that when we um, when we recruited horses, uh, these were these were races that were run under actual race conditions. They had um, they had purses. Uh, we actually also uh, paid a small nominal uh, nomination bonus, if you will, if they allowed them to enter the horse. We gave them a couple hundred bucks uh, to allow us to do that. Um, and by the fact that that they the horses that were enrolled were uh, owner or trainer nominated, we 
could have had a bit higher uh, prevalence of horses that had previously exhibited uh, EIPH, right? That that there was actually horses that were in there that had a prior history of blood at the nostrils or uh, blood uh, identified via endoscopy. Um, that that's not bad per se, but it is something to consider relative to the horses that you might see on an average day uh, at any other track. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Sweeney, you had said at one point when they asked you, is Lasix a masking agent? And maybe it was just me reading into it. It seemed to be qualified by the time of the administration having an impact on its masking effect. Um, yes. And that's why it's well, well regulated and, and, uh, um, and so the way it is used now and the way it's regulated now is, is not a masking agent. If they change that timing, does it have that impact? I just oh, uh. Well, if, if, if potentially if you uh, shorten that time and you could uh, cause more dilute, and I'd have to, again, ask the chemist on what that window is, if it's less than two hours. I know the, the uh, four-hour is a, a uh, amazingly safe window, and I, I know it is, uh, could get shorter and shorter, but there'll be a point where it could have an effect on drug detection. But it, it hasn't been used that way, and so I'm comfortable with its current regulation that it's not masking. And it has to do with urine dilution, and it has to also to do with the methodology that each state is using, whether they're using urine or whether they're using blood. And so, you know, it has some qualifiers, but I think, I think it, the, the message I would like to, to send is that the way it's being used um, in most cases if not all jurisdictions today, uh, prevent it from having any detrimental effect on drug detection. And, and you talked a little bit, I, I think it was you, Dr. Morley, who talked about uh, studying sort of the effects on future generations in terms of the breeding of the horses. Nothing's been done to sort of look at horses that have demonstrated EIPH relative to their offspring and offspring's offspring. Um, not to my knowledge, that the closest thing would be that there have been two, I believe, maybe a third, but two studies that looked at pedigrees and relatedness of horses that had official uh, uh, rulings regarding epistaxis, blood at the nostrils, um, and which is different than, you know, as we talked about all the other grades of EIPH, that would represent the, the most severe. Um, and it does look like there is a uh, some degree of, of if, uh, to, let, to use not the best term, but one that I think um, is understood, a clustering of the pedigrees around horses that had uh, this blood at the nostrils. Um, um, it's not a perfect identification through bloodlines, but it does appear that there is some uh, association with 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 severest bleeding. We have, uh, there's not studies been done to my knowledge that have looked at uh, lower grades uh, with regard to heritability. Great, thank you. Okay, well, we're about the 11.30 point, and I'd like to thank Corinne and Paul very, very much for joining us this morning. It's really great to have you here in, in a virtual uh, teleconference uh, format. We very much appreciate your contributions, and, and uh, thank you all for listening this morning. We're going to convene the next panel in just a few minutes.